Hey, 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 it's Carrie, and I would love to hear from you. Share your story with us on the platform. You're listening to Camouflaged Beauty, a podcast of shared experiences for military and veteran women. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Camouflaged Beauty. My name is Carrie, for those of you who do not know me, and this episode today is absolutely different. First, I am actually in the process of in-processing my new base, and I am currently recording from my hotel room, but even more interesting, I've turned my walk-in shower in the hotel into a broadcast studio. So I'm just asking you guys for grace, as this is also my very first time uh, doing a live recording and recording on a video. Because for those of you who know me know, I do not like to be on video. However, this story is too important to wait and it must be shared. So today I have the pleasure of having three Chief Master Sergeants in the United States Air Force with us. Um, they're gonna share their story. I'll let them tell their story because it is their story to tell. Um, but as I said, it, it is so important where I have decided to be flexible and step out of my own comfort zone so we can share their stories with you. So we're gonna bring them on now to the platform and you can hear their stories for yourself. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Good, how are you? Good morning. I am well. So thank you for joining me. And as I said, I am recording from a hotel room and uh, more importantly, from my hotel bathroom. However, <laughs> I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to share your stories with us uh, here on the Camouflage Beauty platform. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I am Kathy Nisley. I'm a force support squadron chief. Uh, newly minted in January. Uh, I've been in for 24 years. I'm a mother of two, and I'm also married to an active duty chief. He's security forces. Um, we're in Warner Robins now, for now, but we love it here. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot more. That, that's pretty much me. Nice. Chief Cardona. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I am Chief Master Sergeant Antrinia Cardona, and I am the Flight Chief of the Vehicle Management Flight here at Joint Base Charleston in South Carolina. I am married to a retired Air Force veteran. He did uh, 22 years, Master Sergeant retired, Fabian Cardona. And um, I have two kids and just happy to be here. Awesome. And Chief Warner. Thank you all for having me. Good morning to you all. I am Chief Master Sergeant Christina Warner. I am currently the contracting MAGCOM functional for ACC, stationed at Langley Air Force Base. I'm a mother of four. Unlike these lovely blessed ladies, I am single, um, but I'll be married one day. You know, that that's gonna happen. <laughs> Speaking that into existence, right? That is right. <laughs> right, um, according to God's plan. And um, I've been in the military for 23 years, and I'm very happy to be on this platform with these lovely ladies. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I am so honored that you guys are here to share your story with us. Um, and I have not announced as yet, but this story is about uh, surviving um, and thriving through domestic violence. And so um, typically I would ask questions and give you guys to respond. So what I'm gonna do today though, is just allow you guys to talk and share what you feel comfortable with. And um, you know, I just wanna know how you guys have gotten to the places you are now to stand here as chiefs, uh, living your purpose, still serving as leaders and beautiful women, strong women, mothers. How has that journey been for you? Chief Kathy, you want to start with you? So um, it hasn't been easy, but I am so <laughs> hell bound and determined to make my own way, to blaze my own path that I refuse to let the things that happen to me dictate who I am, period. Um, 
there were moments where I didn't think I could go on. I couldn't look myself up, but I had my tribe to help me. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't ideal, but I made my way. Awesome. I, and, and, and what a way you've made to still be here and to still be wearing this uniform. It's gotta be, you know, difficult at, you know, to to experience this and still live through it while we're in the uniform. Chief Cardona, what's your take on that? I, I totally agree with Kathy. It has not been easy, um, yet I was extremely determined. Uh, I come from a background of uh, military uh, family members. My grandma, my grandfather, uh, my grandmother, who was my foundation, uh, one of my aunts and a cousin, you know, they all have either retired out of the army or the Navy. I was the only one that, you know, decided to join the Air Force and for a really funny reason. Um, but it goes back to that strength that my grandmother instilled in us as the matriarch of our family. You know, I just um, did not want to let my mother down, rest her soul. Um, you know, it was just something in me that I know that I just, I was gonna push through no matter what. So I didn't have a choice. Yeah, no, yeah, Chief Warner. Kind of the same thing, I didn't, I didn't have a choice. Um, I had children early, my twins, I had them within my first year of being in the military. And so giving up was not an option because every time I wanted to give up or the thought of giving up popped into my head, I had two little ones that were looking at me and for some reason, it's like when I looked in their eyes, their eyes said, you better not, right? No matter how hard um, it got. And then I remember, so my mother passed at a very early in my career also. And I had my sister and brother that I was, you know, helping raise and then my own kids. And it seemed like everywhere I looked, it's like if I stopped, someone else, someone else would feel the effects of that, you know? And so I can't say that staying in the military was a goal, it, it was actually like I didn't have an option. So I had to make it work. I had to make it fit and I had to figure out how to do it. Um, and then as I did it, it was like, okay, okay, I, I can do this and it is worth it. And it, it's not easy, you know, but you just find it within you and you look around and, you know, it's funny, like Kathy said, you know, you have your tribe. I, I didn't realize for a long time that my kids are my tribe too. You know, mm -hmm. they're looking at me, cheering me on, you know, and, and it's, it just becomes like a, of the internal motivation every time you look at them you're like oh, oh there's the motivation in their face so yeah amazing so it's great to hear where you guys are now but let's go back and talk about where you were um what was it like um unfortunately experiencing this domestic violence while being in the uniform and coming into work every day what was that like for you on a day-to-day -day basis yeah so I, I, I hate saying it, but it, it's true. I lived in a world of professional perfection. That was the thing I could control on a daily basis. Um, it didn't necessarily make me a good or a bad airman or leader, but I lived in a world of perfection. If I could control everything around me in my office, in my job, with my peers, then I had some kind of control. Um, because at home, I didn't have that. Obviously, with, you know, all of the abuse, the verbal abuse, the physical abuse, the mental abuse, I couldn't control what he was saying or what he was doing. So when I went to work, that's where I would control things. But at the same time, I felt like I lived in a bubble because I really couldn't be me to everyone around me. And it's hard living in a glass house of perfection. People can see you, but they can't touch you. They can't get through that glass. They can see you through the glass. They can think that they're close to you, but there's still that thin layer of glass between you and I, because I can't really let you know anything about what's really going on in my life. So there was always that distance that I would create. I didn't even realize sometimes I was creating it. I was a flake. There were things I would say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'll be there, I got you, and I wouldn't show up. For whatever reason, I wouldn't show up. Um, I became so internal with myself and my child and trying to keep that going the best I could 
and work, that's all I really had. That's, that's where I found my saving grace. So I'd be at work for all hours of the night doing stuff with my kids there because I could control that environment. And I was allowed, unfortunately, I hate using that word, but it's true. I was allowed to be at work. So that's where I hid. So it was kind of a, a, a balancing act that I, I had created for myself just so I could function. Wow. Chief Cardona? Being, um, or joining the military, prior to that rather, I had done three years of JROTC. So I knew what I was going to do. Again, it goes back to, you know, my family makeup. When you join the military, a no fail mentality is ingrained in you. And coming from where I'm from, in our, in our environment at home, another mentality is ingrained as well. And that is what happens at home stays at home. So when you couple those two mentalities, the no fail and what happens at home stays at home, it turned me into something I didn't recognize. I, I'm determined regardless. So that no fail mentality, I had no issues with owning that. I'd owned it prior to even joining the, the Air Force. However, that no fail mentality and that what happens at home stays at home mentality nearly broke me mm -hmm. because I was dealing with some horrific things going on at home, but I'd show up to work as if nothing ever happened. I'm on the daily grind. I'm just killing it. And then a toll starts to, to wear on you and you struggle with keeping it all together. And I didn't, I had a tribe, um, but my I, it wasn't a tribe in which I felt comfortable sharing the things that were going on uh, in my household at the time. Oof. <laughs> Sadly, I can say I understand. Um, Chief Warner. Oof. Um. You know, it's like a switch. Right. You suffer at home. The drive to work is my transition time. And then by the time I get to the office, it's game on. Because even in the office, it's 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 gonna sound ironic to say this. I wore his last name, but all I had was that name, right? They didn't know the things that were attached to that name. And so all I could do was on that front show that that name on me was different to prove that I was more than what was happening to me. So it was get into office, do what you got to do. And I did, I mean, I didn't do it well all the time. Just most people a, a, a tribute, a tribute, um, my aggression or my my pursuit of being the best as angry black woman syndrome. So it's easy to fall underneath that that cover, and I was perfectly fine with that. <laughs> you know, I was perfectly fine with it. I mean. I am I am I am a person that I am okay with what you think about me because if you never take the time to get to know me then that is on you that's something that you carry so I I can mask underneath that and then when it was time to go home uh I transitioned from airman so and so to back into um survival mode right and the thing is it's funny because people think they know you right 
They think they have an idea of who you are. Um, they think that they know why you are a certain way or why you carry yourself a certain way, but they have no idea. And the truth be told, um, there is so much more behind the question, how are you today? What's going on with you? People ask it out of a courtesy versus actually out of caring, right? And during my time, I felt, I, I used to ask myself all the time, how do you feel so alone around hundreds of people? every day you are it's the silence will bury you right because you see all this stuff going on it's almost like the tv shows where you're standing still and everything around you is happening and everything that's happening around you that you feel it's so intense and it's so powerful and i often wondered like how do people not see this like how do they not see that every smile isn't real because you know now and maybe because of what um, I've been through, it's very easy for me to say that's not a real smile today, or there's a difference in your tone, or there's a difference in the way, you know, you're interacting, but no one noticed. And I wondered all the time, you know, did they not notice? Or did they, did they notice? And then people have the same mentality, it's not my business, or, you know, I don't want to get involved in it, which, which it's, it's natural. Like people feel that way sometime or people don't know what to do or don't know what to say. So then they do nothing. Um, so it was a, it was an act. It would be like scene one, um, going into work, you know, and then scene two, coming home. And then when it would finally get quiet at night and I could sleep, that was the only time that I could have muster enough to reset for the next day. Wow. Y'all sharing some powerful, powerful things. And, and, and what I'm hearing um, from, from all you ladies, and unfortunately from my own experience, I feel that there is, um, during that process, a sense of shame. Um, did you guys ever feel ashamed of, of who, um, you know, who you were, or what you were experiencing at the, at the time, and you felt like that shame led to fear where you couldn't share that part of yourself with the world? Definitely. So everybody's like, oh my God, you're so strong. You're so together. But yet I'm having my ass handed to me when I go home every yeah. night. How strong am I? I felt like such a fraud, like just a, a fake. You know, yes, in one respect, I am strong. I, I, I bring it when I'm at work. I bring it with my children. I bring it, uh, you know, everywhere. But at the same time, where's that woman? Where's that strong woman that everybody keeps talking about? I'm not quite sure who the hell she is or where the hell she went, but she definitely wasn't around last night when all hell broke loose in her household. She made it through. So I spent a large amount of time feeling fake. Um, and people would see it because that was the one thing I always heard was, oh my God, she's so fake. Yeah. You know, other, you know, oh my God, she's, she's such a bitch. She's so fake. Yeah. Yes, I am, because that's how I'm keeping you away from me. That's how I'm protecting myself and my children and my way of life and, and how, how I can function. Yes, I am fake. Yes, I am a bitch. This is what I have to do to continue to continue. Yeah. Yeah. Chief Cardona? Yes, it's it's it definitely is a struggle. I honestly don't know how I was able to keep it together some days when I did keep it together. The um I was extremely ashamed. I didn't want anybody to know it. I had gone even so far as I didn't even want to get him in trouble. Taking the blame. Just I was so bent on keeping it a secret, uh, overlooking my shame, uh, being ashamed because I didn't want anyone to know about it. I didn't want them to think, um, oh, we got, we got Erin such and such, you know, she's winning these awards. She's leading executive council seats at you name it, private org. 
She's out there. She's out front, fearless leader, even as an airman. I was ashamed to let them know that deep down inside, I was shambles. I was trying to keep it together for my son. My, I only had my oldest son at the time. And um, again, it just went back to that horrible mentality of what stays at home, or excuse me, what happens at home stays at home. I, I'm telling you, I own that for all the wrong reasons. So yes, extremely ashamed. Yeah. Concur. Shame was, that might as well have been, been my middle name. Uh, <laughs> at the time, you know, I, I carried that. That was like my backpack, my purse. That that was what it was. And for me, it wasn't um, about having a conversation with anyone because I'd already, I'd already had things happen to me before where I tried to tell and no one listened. So now it's like, oh, do, do I risk it and tell someone this and then they not listen? I don't think I was ready for the, the answer to that. So I just, I carried it. I carried it with me. Um, and I, I just remember, I used to always just fall back on my mom's words. And that's difficult for me to say because me and my mom did not have uh, a good relationship, right? But my mom used to tell me all the time, you know, things happen to you so you could share your story. And I just was like, well, how many more things have to happen that I need to share, <laughs> okay? Because in a minute, I'm going to be a phenomenal storyteller. Um, <laughs> because, it, and it was it was hard, right? And then even now, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be on this show, but there's still, there's still bits of it. There's still bits of that shame. Wondering, okay, after we do this show, will the looks be different? Will the conversations be different? You still carry that. And it's a long healing process that that you go through um but you walk it, I, now i carry the shame different right I carry the shame in my back pocket and i sit on it as much as i can versus carrying it on my chest or carrying it across my face you know because i'm going to put that shame um uh, where it needs to be and that's behind me but there are times you know you have something in your back pocket it feels a little funny makes you uncomfortable you know and i just readjust and try to try to remember that that's just a piece of me. It's not um, who I am um, altogether. It's just a small piece of, of who I am. So shame, yeah, we live together. <laughs> that's so powerful because you're you're right. It doesn't go away. You know, you and that shame, y'all kind of go together. You're in this this relationship, and and they're right next to you throughout the whole process. And people are going to judge you based off the story that you share because of the um, perceptions that they may have on you. They put you on their own pedestals or whatever the case may be. Um, I know a part for me um, with my own story, um, I felt just based off the way that I was raised that I almost had to protect my husband. Okay. I had to protect him. Although I knew it was going on, you know, I had to protect who he was because that's still a part of me. So in protecting him, I was also protecting myself and our name. Did any of you ladies ever feel anything close to that? Definitely. Um, there were moments and situations where I put myself on the line to ensure his safety and, and his clean reputation he at the time had quite a reputation and you know I had had it so ingrained in my head that if I did not support him and support that then I would be looked at as a, a horrible wife a horrible person so I hid everything you name it I hid it I called in favors from people to cover up the things that he had done now, to me, not only to me, but to himself. Um, so he wouldn't have to go into the ER and then people would ask questions as to what had happened. Um, I would find a way. And there were so many enablers around us that helped him, that helped me help him, help him instead of speaking up and saying, what, what's going on? Like, why, why are you asking me to come over to um, put stitches in his hand because he had put his hand through a glass window to grab my face. 
why? Why are you calling me and asking me to do this? And they knew, but I w- it was, like I said, it was so ingrained in my being that I had to protect him. It, it never even crossed my mind that I could get in trouble for this too. Like I was putting myself out there for him. So yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot to maintain. Keith? <clears throat> yes, uh, there were often times that uh, many, many I, I just, I lost count that I felt like I had to um, protect him. You know, he was one that was very charismatic. He was, he had all the friends. We, they all knew who I was. He was well known around the local area, the base, rounding bases, you name it. So any mention of this would, you know, tinge his reputation. I can remember I had called the local law enforcement office off base to deal with the many nights that he and I had gotten to these altercations. And they, they, a few times they, you know, took a lot of pictures of the, 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 the black eyes, the marks around my neck, you name it. And they'd ask if I wanted to press charges. No, I don't want to press charges. That was difficult for me. Um, They did put, uh, at one point in time, put a restraining order. And he had friends that knew what was going on, but they enabled it. They were enablers as well. They would come pick him up from the sheriff's office. You can stay over to my house for the weekend until your restraining order runs out, and then you can go back home. And um, it was difficult to me, but I started to think about how bad I wanted to break that cycle. And it took me a lot of courage, and it took a lot of years to do it. And the only thing I kept thinking about was my mother. So my stepfather shot and killed my mother in the next room that I was asleep. I was laying asleep with my little brother and my little sister. So domestic violence for me and my family, it runs so deep, so deep. Going back to your question, yes. There were a lot of times where I felt like I had to uh, protect his name for numerous reasons. Over time, I, I came to regret that because I, you know, I wasn't reaching out for the help. I was ashamed. I didn't want to get him into trouble. I didn't want his supervisors to know. At the time, I was an airman. He was an NCO. So he was already well established at the base that I had just arrived to. It was a lot of different factors there that made it very difficult for me to say something. So I hid it, I protected him. And in the process, I thought I was protecting myself. Chief? You know, you say chief sometimes, I'm like, who talking? (laughs) Who is it? I think this question is a little bit more difficult for me because my, um, abuser wasn't in the military, right? Um, but I was so new to the military, I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know who to call or or, or what because I remember calling the police, um, the security forces, they show up and uh, I mean, they just take them to the gate, right? Take them to the gate. But the gate was in walking distance from my house. <laughs> He just show his ID card and walk back on base. <laughs> so I just had enough time to breathe from the drive to the gate until he walked back. That was it. That, that was all I had. Um, and then eventually it got to the point of why, why am I even calling security forces? 
if that's all that's going to happen, I might as well just go hide in another room or hide in the closet and until uh, he cooled off. It was the same amount of time, right? So I don't think I was protecting his name uh, or protecting him. Uh, I think I just was trying to survive. And I didn't know how to do that because I'd only been in the military. All this happened and started in the first year being in the military. So I didn't even know what the, who the helping agencies were, who to talk to. Um, I didn't trust anybody uh, in the military. So it was just like not protecting him. It was just like, I got to figure this out. There was no going home um, if if the military didn't work out. There was nowhere to go home to. Home being the operative word. Um, so I had to make it work. And so the only way to make it work was to hide in plain sight. So I don't, I don't feel like I protected his name. I just feel like I had to survive. So, wow. The hardest part about this for me, you know, just hearing bits and pieces of your story is to know that through all this process, you all were mothers. What is it like experiencing this with babies right next to you, around you every day, looking at you with those big, beautiful, innocent eyes? What does that do to you as a mother and as a woman experiencing domestic violence? So, oddly enough, I was... Uh, weirdly proud that my, I had kept my kids from ever seeing what happened until it happened and she saw it and she saw the worst part of it. And in that moment, it clicked in my head. I have a daughter and now I'm showing her that this is okay. And I have a son and I'm showing him that this is fine for you to do to a woman. No, we're not doing that. That was the, the stick that broke the camel's back was when I truly realized I couldn't hide it from them anymore. I couldn't. I couldn't keep that nasty little secret hidden from everybody in, to include them anymore. And that's that was what pushed me not to just speak up because I had told people, but to like actually do something, leave him. Don't stay. Don't listen to him. Don't have him pull you back. It's time to go because you have a greater responsibility to your children. If you can't value yourself, you got to value them. And that I changed. That's when I changed everything. Wow. Cardona. My abuse started when I was pregnant with our first child. I can remember numerous times he picked me up on my throat and I was pregnant and threw me against a wall or tossed me into a room and told me to sit there and don't move. And he'd lock me in there for hours. Fast forward, I'd given birth to our first son and then our second son there, 19 months apart. And uh, they would hear mom scream often. He tried to muffle it with music or any show or movie plan on the television. He raised the volume of that. My boys, you, you know, it's, I, I had a talk with my oldest son who's now 19, just last week. And I, I tried to, explain to him what mom is doing right now, how mom is using her voice to speak out against these things that are happening to women 
and to some to men as well. And I wanted to just be very detailed and blunt. I I'm, I don't hide anything from them. And I, I just tell them, hey, guys, this is what happened to me. This is what this platform is going to be about. And um, my son, 19 years old, mom, I still remember some of those things. I didn't know what to do. I remember hearing the, the knocks on the wall. I didn't know what I didn't know what was going on, but I had an idea. Your room door was locked. Couldn't get in. I'm glad because I didn't want them to get in when that would happen. You know, their father thought that he was doing an honorable thing by saying to me, I don't want my boys to see this. Yet they saw anyway, they heard. What did they think? I come out of the room, so wherever we're at, the first thing they're doing is looking at mom's face to see if mom was crying, see if mom's okay. What did I do? I put on a happy face. I got my pulled myself together because I did not want my boys to see what I was going through. My children were hurt. and suffered broken bones at the hands of him. And they were only two months old. I carry that with me every time I see them. So to, to be a mom going through this, It's the hardest thing I ever did. And I don't think that there's any challenge I could ever face that would be harder than that. Wow. Ladies, uh, you guys are touching on some uh, that will be a trigger for a lot of people. And my question for you now is really about wearing this uniform. How do you as leaders now take care of your people? We often say, take care of your people. How do you, knowing everything that you've been through, how has that changed the way you take care of your people? The concept of being intrusive. I live in that. I am I am intrusive because nobody was intrusive with me. And they they saw it. So I pride myself on not just walking by and being like, Good morning, good morning, good morning, how are you guys doing? How are you guys? No. This is an interaction. Good morning, how are you? I am present for my people and I make it a point to though if I walk away with anything else wearing this uniform my people know I actually do care these are extra words that are spoken to sound good as a leader I do care I make it a point I will uh, get in there as <laughs> I get in your shit What's going on? How, no, no, really, how's your day? Um, if you give me that blanket bland answer, I'll come back. Nope, you had a little weird micro burst of energy going on there. I don't know what that's about, but what's going on? 
well, uh, and then they start to talk. And that's when I feel like I can make the biggest impact is when they open up to me because then we can figure out what needs to be done. We can work on it. So for me, it's just being intrusive and being present. I've learned as a leader today to um, look for certain signs that I wish uh, people would have noticed with me in my situation. So I, I pay very close attention to the nonverbals, the body language. I try to have day-to-day -day interactions. I go, I do a deep dive. Um, and I ask the questions about family members, you know, their immediate family member, their extended family. I try to get into who they are as a person. And I do that with compassion because I wasn't afforded the compassion when I was coming up in the Air Force. So I realized that it's a different, it's a different group of airmen now. And all they want is for a leader to show that they truly care about them and not just the blowing smoke in the smoke and mirrors. The way I do that though is by actions. And um, you know, when I talk to them, I've learned now to be more transparent. And I realize that the airmen and NCOs, and some of your peers rather, they will connect to you on a more personal level when they see the authentic side of you. It took a lot of courage for me to even do that, to just be transparent and let people know, hey, you know, I, I've been through a similar situation like that. Come, come talk to me. My door is always open. You know what about that? I'm going to come see you. I have the recall roster. I'm going to text you. How's it going? What's up? What's up? You looked a little off today. You know, what, what, what you, I realized you didn't want to talk in front of a group of people, but I want you to know that I am always here for you. And that goes beyond the blanket. I'm here for you. I honestly cannot stand that because I feel like most people, they don't really mean it. And again, it goes back to me saying that I try to show anybody who's around me that by actions that I, I truly mean it. I used to be a woman of few words because I was trying to hide so much of what was going on in my life. But it's definitely different now. I, again, I ask detailed questions. I try to share a part of me that most may seem to think that, oh, wow, I can't, I can't believe you, you've gone through that. You know, wow, chief, you, for real, you did that? You said that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just look for those signs because they were overlooked when it was my turn. So similar to what uh, Kathy and Antonia said, uh, I try to make myself available. I think I do that almost sometimes to my detriment because I will be on uh, Messenger talking to people, Facebook, Instagram. I, I mean, my introduction to people or to units is like, I will talk to you on any method that you are comfortable with. I make myself available on all platforms. I found myself um, playing Call of Duty um, just to have interaction uh, <laughs> with airmen, whatever it, it takes whatever makes them feel comfortable just to have, you know, a check-in with them. Um, and I know some people think that, oh, she's being extra or she's, you know, she's being fake. But I, I realized that if some, somebody had to reach me at the level that I was at, and I think sometimes as leaders, we want our airmen to come to us, but we got to go to them, right? Um, so social media and things like that, you know, you know, it's becoming more open that people are using it. But before people are like, I don't want to use, you know, I don't want to be friends uh, with people on Facebook or whatever the case may be, but friends in that sense 
to me doesn't mean that that we are friends that way. It means this is an avenue uh, for us to communicate. And it and I am careful about things that I post because it it allows them to see me as a human, um, me as a mom, me in the things that I'm doing to challenge myself, me being silly, so that they are more comfortable, you know, coming and talking to me. Like I find so many people at various levels, you know, because we lead up. We check up and we check down when it comes to emotions and things that are happening. Um, and, and when you do that, you realize you have so many things in common with people that you might not have got uh, in regular conversation. So I, I try to make myself available, I try to tell people that I'm available. And I understand that in doing that, you know, it can be taxing. But I try to be honest with people and say, hey, give me three minutes. I'll call you back. Give me two minutes. Or, or uh, if someone says it's an emergency, I need to talk now. I'll stop what I'm doing. I mean, I've been on telecons and say, I got to sign off so I can be here in that moment with so-and-so because what they are going through is real. And it's also understanding that something that might be small to me might be huge for that person. And it's not for me to judge that. It's for me to be with them um, in that moment. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do, right? Because sometimes we are quick to say, oh, man, you'll be fine, right? It's going to be okay. And that person only knows that much. Like the first time somebody picks up a 25 pound weight, <laughs> they're like, um, I need to start with tens, <laughs> you know? And then you have other people that pick up 25 weight and they're like, this is nothing. It's the same thing with what they're going through what they're dealing with. I, I, it's not for me to tell me what they can carry or what they can bear and how it weighs on them. It's not at all for that, uh, for me to do that. It's just for me to be available because our airmen have said, I want somebody to hear me. That's the best thing you could ever do is hear someone to be heard, to be heard. Man, that's the most powerful thing in the world to feel like I can talk and I can get this out. And sometimes that's all they need to do. And, and also sometimes once they do it, they walk themselves through the answer. They just needed someone to let them get it all out a safe zone. And that's what we have to um, create. So when the Air Force start moving to um, telling leaders we need to be more vulnerable, uh, we need to be more open, I was here for it. I probably could hashtag that, here for it, <laughs> here for it all, because it's opened the door um, to so many. I know that was a long answer to your question, but I mean, that's what we got to do every day. It's one of the reasons that I stay past 20 years, because somebody needs somebody that they can open up to um, and that they can hear. It, it blues me every time someone says, hey, so-and-so told me that, that you would listen. Yep, let, let's do it. it. And it just drives me. And it's not um, males or females. It's anyone, anyone particular that just says, I need to talk. And, and I love it. So, yeah. Oh, no, that was a perfect answer, Chief Warner. I send people to you all the time, <laughs> all the time. I'd be like, find her on Facebook or I am or IG or whatever. Just tell her I sent you. She's going to be there for you. So I, I do appreciate uh, leaders like you, uh, all you ladies who are, are vulnerable and, and open and, 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 and trying to be in their business to get that information out. So all those things, mother, leader, chief. But first, you guys are women. After experiencing all the things that you have experienced before you guys got married again um, or started, how was that to going back into the dating world? What was that process like for you? <laughs> now I'm about to be all in your personal business. So what was that process like to be vulnerable and start trusting again? So... It was, <laughs> it was interesting. There you go. There's a word. It was interesting. Um, I realized that when I came back into the dating scene, I was uh, far more picky. Um, I'd rule you out quick. Like, we don't, we don't have time for this. Nope, you're not. You're not it. <laughs> um, I was more perceptive to uh, flashing lights and, and issues that I would see. Oh, no, we're, we can't do this. We're, nope, bye. Like, we're done. We're not going there anymore. Um, I was way far more intolerant of, of BS and, and odd things. It was, you will either step up to be with me or you will step out 
because I'm moving. So you, you gotta, you gotta pick what you're going to do. And, um, my husband, he, he knew it. I was very honest and upfront about it with anyone. <laughs> Look, this is how it works. <laughs> like, because I, what I felt like is a lot of people go into dating and they're not upfront and honest about what they're trying to get at. I, I just didn't have the tolerance for the game, the, the back and forth. It's like, look, I'm, and I'm a mom of two, so I don't have time to be playing these games with you either. Like I got two little kids and I'm cool with just having my kids forever. So you have to figure out what you want. Like, and it is a package deal, but I don't want you. I was very protective of anyone meeting them. They didn't realize I dated other people. All they knew is I got married to dad, which is my husband. That's all they knew. They, my daughter was 16 when she found out I dated other people. And then she looked at me like I was like horrible. Oh my God, you dated other people? Yes, that's how it works. Like I didn't just meet him and be like, oh, this is it. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it, the entire situation changed my look, my outlook on and I'm dating on interaction in general. So I just became a little bit more intolerant of the BS. Same, same with Kathy said. I knew exactly what I wanted. And my husband was, he would always tell me, you're so blunt. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, you know, I, I, you know, when we're dating, I, I don't know if you all recall the, if there's a meme that goes around where there's a Barbie and a Ken and they're in the restroom and Ken is on the toilet and Barbie's just over the, the, the sink, just putting her makeup on. I told my husband, I say, Hey, I don't have time for all this, this, you know, uh, what do you call it? Moonlighter or honeymooning or whatever the phase is. I was like, let's skip that all together. Yes. Women toot. We toot. <laughs> I just wanted to skip all that fake, oh, this, this, and that. I was just like, you know what? I've gone through so much. Um, I'm just going to let him see the real me, but I'm going to move past that and just get to the real me part. And yeah, but, you know, after that uh, situation, I didn't really date that much. I really didn't have the confidence in my husband, uh, my now and my husband. Uh, we, we just kind of, you know, we dated. And then one thing led to another and we got married. So I didn't really have much time to kind of like date, if you will. <laughs> I think for me, as I, <laughs> for me, it is, I had to realize some things about myself first, right? Um, and so um, I am, I am an A-type person. Um, I've been told that often, let's say, you know, I can be aggressive. Um, and then I had to realize that some of my aggression wasn't necessarily because uh, I was really that aggressive. It's just, I didn't think anyone was worthy of my soft side, you know? And when we talk about relationships and, and the true meaning of being submissive, right? And the true meaning of a husband and a wife, you know, sometimes I think we go into these things and we're looking for a husband. I, I'm not looking for a husband. I'm not looking for anything really, but it, it, for looking, we're going to use it just as an example, but I want a partner. I want um, someone who supports me in all my endeavors. So I'm going to be completely transparent. I got ADHD and I try to do 758,000 things at one time. At one time, It's just me. It's how I live. It's my life. And I love every minute of it. I'm a crafty mom a book author, I want to go snowboarding and I want to go skydiving and then I want to get my nails done and be cute and go to the gym. I'm going to do all those things, period, point blank, right? So you got to love every part of me. So I need a partner in crime that's going to accept all those things and understand that you have to see my heart, right? There are times when I'm going to be triggered by something and sometimes it comes out a little bit more aggressive than what I intend because you don't know what triggers you until you're in a triggered situation, period, um, point blank. Um, and so, you know, going through, you know, the dating stage, it is one being open about what happened, right? 
Now, I don't just come in and just give them all of my information. I don't just dunk them into this is, you know, this is what happened to me. But having it be able to have those conversations, right, to, to say, you know, I reacted this way because of this. Um, and then knowing that I'm working on myself because I am um, constantly trying to improve myself. Because if I'm looking for a partner, I have to make sure I meet the qualifications um, to be a good partner um, as well. And then to be submissive in the fact that um, because I'm so aggressive, I will take the lead on everything. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> on everything. I just do it by nature. You know, I remember one time <laughs> when I was married uh, to my previous husband, and I remember uh, we have rental properties uh, and the garbage disposal went out, right? We we're going to put it on the market. The garbage disposal went out. Now, I have changed garbage disposals several times. But he was like, I'm going to change this garbage disposal. Fast forward four hours later where the garbage disposal was still not changed out. I was itching. I was twitching. Like if if you just let me, if you, I would have already had this change out. So luckily, a phone call came in. He said, I need to step outside, take this phone call. I said, oh, thank you. By the time he came back in, the garbage disposal was um, switched out, cleaned up, and I was packed up, ready to go. Right? That didn't go too well at all. Um, he was like, you know, I'm the man. I'm supposed to be able to do these things. And not in a, in a demeaning way. He just was raised that, you know, men do these things and women do these things. And and even though we were married at the time, that was like the first click. It was like, mm, it's not a partnership, right? You need to accept the strengths that I have. I need to accept the strengths that you have. And he might be good at putting up lines, but I am good at Changing out garbage disposals, putting up ceiling fans, and doing all this other crafty work. I'm a tinkerer. You might as well call me Tinkerbell. <laughs> you know, it's just what I do um, because I, I mean, it, it calms me, like following the instructions, because we, we follow instructions, they don't. Follow the instructions and doing that, it calms me, <laughs> you know, and it relaxes me. But I say all that to say that uh, it makes me more honest. I am way more honest with myself, um, what I want, and with the individual. This is me. And then I have to give them time to accept that it's me. And then I have to give them time to understand for him and I to understand that there might he might have gone through some things and there might be triggers and stuff like that. And then it's the coming together that makes it a partnership, that makes it a divine union, that pulls us together in such a way that we are friends first before we are anything else. Because then when everything else is lost, you can go back to we are friends and then we can rebuild from there. So, it, it yeah, it's made me more more honest and everybody is not ready for honesty. And everybody is not really ready for unconditional love and saying, I am here. I'm not going anywhere. And so they can move on. And I'll still be here. <laughs> Period. Point blank. Tinkering. 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 Away. Tinkering. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a perfect answer. So. Before I talk about uh, the journey of, of writing this book, um, before we talk about the journey of writing this book and what that may have, you know, done for you, what has been the feedback that you received um, from your coworkers and your leaders, peers and leaders who did not know your story before? Um, so everybody's been super supportive. They're excited. They want copies. Oh my goodness. What are you doing? And, and then when I begin to explain what, what the book means, what the stories are, there's a few of them that have looked at me very shocked. They're like, Oh, <laughs> like they want to be super supportive, but they didn't realize what they were getting themselves into when they started and they started talking. And then, then there's that moment where they'll kind of look at me and be like, so if this is what the book's about and you're one of the authors in the book, you can see them like connecting the dots. Um, that means that this is something you went through. Yes, this is exactly something I went through. You are correct. And I begin to explain it to them, but it's usually an explanation that's more about what they are willing to handle, I guess, what they can understand um, and, and embrace 
because I honestly found that with some people, if you're too upfront about it, you turn them off. Um, they can only take so much. So you got to explain it to them, to their expectation. And I'm fine with that because regardless of how much of my story I, I am sharing, I'm still sharing it. And sometimes that helps them open up to me. So I um, recently found out that one of our generals that I'm, I'm close with, um, I did not realize she had gone through the same thing. Not that her rank has anything to do with it, but normally you don't, you just don't see someone that's up in that position, <laughs> admit those things. Um, and she had not really gotten to the point where she was telling her story. Um, she's not there yet and that's fine. But in me talking to her and introducing what I'm doing in bits and pieces, enough that she could handle, she began to open up to me. So that was a really big deal for me to be a part of. And that's why I'm doing it. I mean, I want even the smallest portion of my story to begin to open a door for somebody else to begin to tell their story. Yeah, pretty. Everybody's pretty accepting. So before we move on to Chief Cardona, uh, I just want to say, ma'am, um, just the same way you view that general is the same way we view you. You know, true. To have three chiefs, <laughs> you know, sitting here on this platform sharing this story, it's not easy to do. Uh, but we do appreciate you guys sharing, and and we we recognize it as as empowering and uplifting. Um, to give someone the strength to know that they too can survive these things. So thank you. Chief Cardona. Uh, yes. So I don't recall if I've actually shared this news with my current uh, leadership, um, but a, a previous uh, a commander of mine came down here to visit me. We had lunch and I shared with her and I simply adore her. her. And it's, it's to say extremely supportive would be an understatement. And, you know, she and I have had a connection ever since I was her superintendent, you know, a few years ago and just um, amazing and definitely reinforced, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my courage in, in this journey. But um, as far as my, my peers, my sister, che sister cheese, my brother cheese, you know, everyone has been so supportive. And honestly, I thought it would be sort of one of those taboo uh, topics in that, you know, everyone wanted to kind of like stiff arm. Oh, oh, that's what the book is about. Oh, mm, ah, you know, the, the cat kind of, you know, takes the tongue there. But it's been quite the opposite. Um, I, there are those who, you know, just won't, won't say anything past the, you know, uh, I think I think it was uh, Chief Warner who mentioned that, you know, you get the, the, the looks, you know, so they won't say much. So that's letting me know that, oh, you, you kind of you maybe you heard something. Um, my husband, extremely supportive. My co-workers, you know, I, I told my husband what this is about. And it's just like unimaginable support, especially considering the topic and. It's been amazing. My my boys, my boys have been super supportive. You know, they're made of small or uh, not very many words, but, you know, I know them enough to know that, you know, oh, that's pretty cool, mom. You know, if I can get that from them, that just, you know, that's all I need. But yeah, I've been, I'm experiencing some fairly good, fairly, fairly good uh, support you know, across all spectrums. I would say the support has been mind blowing. I mean, I used to post something on Facebook and maybe I get like 15 likes, <laughs> you know, um, I'm a private person. Um, as it is, I don't talk about uh, a lot of things in, in my private, private life is just for me. I feel like if I, if I lack of better words, if I love in private, um, I can heal in private and I can hurt in private. Um, and not that it's not for the world to know, right? To know um, where I'm at with with those things. My circle, man, I have an amazing circle. I have an amazing um, support group that 
we uplift and share each other's um, highs and lows and, and everything that that circle is my fuel, you know, if you will. But as I begin posting these things, talking about uh, my word for 2021 is transformational, right? And, and then I say I'm a whole vibe because I'm I'm coming out swinging, <laughs> right? Uh, coming out swinging um, in 2021, just releasing so many different parts of me and so many things. Going back to my previous statement about I, I try to do 7,000 things at one time, um, but it has been overwhelming how many people and then the people at various levels that are watching and they're waiting and they're contacting on when is the release when is this piece when's the next you know show that you're going to be on and it has been empowering in ways that I didn't think um one I didn't think that I needed I didn't think I needed you know other people's validation you know in things and two I didn't think I needed it I didn't think I needed everyone to know in order to help right but then you realize that as people know and they see you and, and they absorb what you've been through, they are sharing it and it is opening the doors to many other conversations. And I think when I started this journey, it was how do we how do we have more conversations about this? We tend to talk about, um, I don't know, we talk about homosexuality as, as an example, right? But we don't talk about domestic violence as often and it's almost like it's revert, reserved for um the month that, that's when it becomes a big thing and and it's not because it's happening all the time but to see the responses the comments the uh congratulations the let me know how i can help uh all of those things it, it's amazing and it's like finally because it goes back to also what i said before like to be heard Right. And there's a time and a place and almost validates what my mother said that, you know, things happen to you so you can tell your story. And it's the timing of when you come out with your story, when it is the most effective, because you can tell someone something at one time and it does nothing. But when you tell them at the right time, it is impactful, it is powerful and it breaks barriers. So I appreciate it. And anybody that watched this show, I thank you so much for the support and the boost of confidence um, and the cheers because they, they make me feel um, that I can do more. And to that circle, and they all know who they are. Uh, I wouldn't have taken this step without y'all. So I appreciate it. So I saw the cover of this book. And I want you guys to tell me about this journey how did you know it was time to, to share this story on that level? Because they know going back now, right? It's on Prince, it's everywhere. We all know your name. We see your faces in all these shows. I know where y'all work at. Uh, Chief Cardona, I know you say you have to share with your leadership, but I did see you on a Facebook thing with Chief Kelly, so I already knew who you were. You can't hide from us anymore. Your story is now out here for the world. What has that journey been like? for you initially there was some hesitation you know it's a little scary you know you're just you're just gonna put it on out there and you know you you, you think about your friends and your kids and the people that don't know it and how are how are they all gonna take it so for me my gatekeepers are my children I love them you <laughs> they are a lot my daughter especially is a lot to deal with wonder where she got that from um but <laughs> Um, she was the first person I, I went to and said, look, this is what, I, you know, Chris, my love, um, pulled me into this. And I said, this is what we're planning on doing. What do you think? And leave it to a 21 year old to be just very nonchalant. She's like, it's your story. You should tell it. I was like, okay. <laughs> like here I am worried about what you're gonna think. She's like, it's your story. You can tell it. She's like, really doesn't make you know much of a difference to me but it's going to make a difference to you so if you are choosing to share it share it go do it go live your best life mom and <laughs> off into the shadows she goes my son um he was a little he's very very reserved he's a super reserved child i'm not sure where he came from um but he is the king of one liners really he's very good at them and he's like Turn looked at me. He's like, not my business. I got you, mom. 
No, <laughs> not my business. I got you. So getting my gatekeeper's approval and then my husband's immense support and love behind whatever it is I want to do with my story. I was good. I was good. Um, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. You know, my, my girlfriends, my, my, my sister chiefs brought me into this and I love them for it because I, I feel like it's a bond that just can't be undone no matter what. Like I will always be able to reach out to them no matter what. And we have that connection. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I answered your question. <laughs> I kind of went out on a tangent. No, perfect. Uh, no, she cut on. What about you? Well, mine, as you mentioned, it started with uh, just a car ride. I was I was in the car with you know Chief uh, Charmaine Kelly, who is currently the four thirty seventh Air Wing uh, Command Chief. And uh, we were just having a conversation and I shared a little bit about my story and it was just so uh, impactful for her. She encouraged me to share it. And I explained to her that, you know, I feel like 2021 is the year that I'm going to share the story. I just was not quite ready to, to do it just yet. So um, fast forward, I talked with my husband and again, he's he's my biggest supporter, and he said, "Go for it. Why not?" You know, and, and I explained to the both of them that I'm willing to put my shame aside and you know my embarrassment because for the simple fact that it had gone on so long for me. It started when I was a senior airman, and it carried on and didn't end until I was a master sergeant. And I was just like, you know what? My heart right now is telling me that I need to do this because there could very well be someone else who may be going through the same situation. And I just had to pull up my big girl pants. And I was just like, you know what? Bump it. I'm going to do it. And no later than I had gotten to work on that Monday, because this, this is a car wide with uh, Chief Kelly happened over the weekend. I got into work on Monday to an email from her exec, ma'am, I have some white space on her calendar. Can we do it on such and such date? And then that 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 that, that hard swallow came. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so it, it it definitely started with her, uh, you know, and then again, talking with my husband and then our dear friend, Yolanda Jerry, who's a visionary for our anthology project. I've known her since uh, 2009. Um, this opportunity came up and I was just like, you know what? I've done this, um, this segment on Sharicola with Kelly. And I was like, you know what, Trina, it's time to put your money where your mouth is, girl. Get out of here. And my word for 2021 is hashtag unveil. And I took that to heart. I was going to unveil all the things that happened to me um, in hopes that it can help inspire someone to get out of the situation or to avoid to get into that situation. And, you know, just being transparent. Hey, I am a chief. You know, I it started when I was a senior airman. That's domestic violence does not care what rank you are, doesn't care what race you are. It, it, nothing's off the table. So yeah, that's how, that's how this thing started for me. Wow. Chief Warner. So I'm going to say that COVID is the reason <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for all of this from the beginning, right? Um, I had PCS uh, to Barstow Air Force Base and um, that was a hard PCS for me. It was very tough. Um, but then when I got there, I started doing all these things and I had reached out to some friends, um, and I'd asked them, I say, Hey, I want to write this book. I want to write this book. Um, and I'm, I'm asking, are you willing to share your stories? Now? I don't, I didn't know what I was doing. I had an idea in my head. So I reached out to people and I wanted the book to be about, um, women in the military and things that they've dealt with. And it didn't have to be about domestic violence. We all deal with different things. 
And so um, that's all I'm going to say about that, because that book is still in the works, because I did reach out to people and they did provide me their stories. Um, but I wasn't done with it. It wasn't something was missing. And so I paused on that. And then COVID happened and I started really working on myself, doing some internal searching. And I just started feeling this pull. There was a, a, a hard pull on me. And so I had to pause and I had to, to pray about it and say, I, I submit to, to whatever it is you want to have me do. So fast forward, um, fast forward, uh, I got some other opportunities to tell a little bit of my story. And I realized that, that, that it was hard, right? Like, I'm like, okay. Um, and then you realize as you're telling the story, what parts um, still hurt more, you know, than others. Like I've told my story several times, but today it seemed to be a little bit harder as an example. Right. And then one day I'm on the phone talking to Antrinia and I don't know what happened after that. Everything after that was a complete blur. The next thing I know, um, I'm on the phone with uh, Dr. Jerry. And then after that, I'm calling Kathy. And then next thing you know, the book is a go. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, I need to talk to some people. Let me talk to my circle. Let me talk to my circle. Hey, are you guys good with this? This is what it's going to mean. And then I remember it was like a Sunday night. Um, I poured a glass of wine and I lit a cigar and I sat there and I said, okay, all right, all right, this is about to happen. It's, it's about to go down. And there was, just as you said, there was no turning back, you know? And so it was full steam ahead and but that gave me it, it was a little bit scary, but it was also the 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 peace of knowing that this this is the time right here. Everything's right. My twins were OK with me talking about it. My circle was like, I support you in all endeavors. Go do it. I mean, every time I tell them that I'm getting on one of these, they're like 700 text messages, the cheers, the call. They're like, let me see what you look like. You know, puff this part of your hair out. You know, this color, wear this color. You know, it's, and it's amazing. And then even me, Kathy, and Trinia, we're texting back and back and forth and we're boosting each other up. And it's amazing. Um, but it kind of caught me off guard. I thought I was moving in one direction and then all these other things happened. I published my first children's book. You know, there's another one that's coming out. Um, and it's just been awesome because all of these things are just happening. And it, it's like, man, it must have been the time to do it exactly like what um, and Trinia said. It's it's uh, it's amazing. And it's like, OK, I'm here for it all. All of it. Wow. Well, before we wrap up, the Camouflage Beauty platform is really for um, military women to share their experiences. This is what we stand for. So I thank you all uh, for being a part of this and for sharing your stories um, with the DOD population, military specifically. Um, my last question for you all is if you could summarize, this is your last opportunity to give advice to women who are listening today. What would you tell our listeners about you, about your journey, or just about being a survivor in general? Um, I would tell them, and I've, I've actually shared this with my airmen a few different times. Don't, don't sit in it. You're, you're never going to ever be alone. You just have to let us in. There isn't a person on the face of this earth that in some way, shape, or form is unable to understand or relate to whatever it is that you're going through. But you have to open the door for them. So open the door, even if it's just a little, open the door. I guarantee you there'll be a whisper or a voice, somebody on the other end of that door waiting to help you, wanting to help you. Um, I am, I have a lot to deal with. I'm a live wire. I pride myself on that. I am not quiet. I am, I am, I am that stronger person than I was. And I'm that person that I guess everybody thought I was supposed to be, but I knew that I wasn't like, it was a facade. It was fake. I'm living up to that now. That is my goal. I'm living up to that now. And you're not going to keep me quiet. You're not going to hold me down. And I'm always going to have your back. 
So that's what I kind of leave people with. Um, you don't have to tell your whole story like I did. You don't have to write a chapter in a book. Just open the door. We're all here. We're all here. We're all waiting and we're all willing. That's all I got. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed every single bit of the conversation we had today. I didn't realize some of my wounds weren't completely healed either, but that's, that's forward motion. So that's positive. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Your turn, Chief Cardona. <clears throat> I'd share that you are bold. You have the strength. It's lying deep within you. It will be challenging. Yes, it's scary. But you are worth more than the situation that you're in. Tell someone, reach out to myself, Chris Warner, Kathy Nicely. You are not alone. We have been there. This is only a small part of our story. We have several, several more to share. And as you can see, we're not afraid to share them anymore. We are unveiling. I feel empowered. These ladies are all empowered. They empower me. You're not alone. I lean on them when I feel like I'm alone. Do it afraid. The Air Force or the military as a whole is a lot different than when we all three were airmen. And in a sense, it's a lot better. The helping agencies have grown immensely. There are more compassionate and empathetic leaders in your presence. Us three, we leaders are being authentic, transparent, because we know ultimately our goal is to help if it's only just one person, that will warm our hearts so much. And we will trip over ourselves day in and day out to help that person. You're loved. We love you. Hang in there. Reach out to us. Find a confidant. And on your moment, we're all resilient. That resiliency lies within you. We're here to help you. Chief Warner. I have said many times over, and it took me a long time to realize it. Everything you need, it is within you. It's been given to you since birth. We're all given gifts and special things, but you have to open that case and pull it out right? You, you got to open it and pull it out. And just know that when you open that door, I mean, some cases, the lock on it, they got um, three locks on it, a keypad, an eye scan, retina, whatever it takes to open up and unlock what's within you, fingerprint, you know, all of those things. Open it. Open it and unlock you. Unleash what that trauma and abuse and whatever it is that's covered over your gifts. Open it because it's in there. And man, what a feeling it is when you open it and your light shines bright and your light will light others and empower others. We are all a gift and a blessing to other people in our due time. And But for the DOD members that are listening, be compassionate, be open, be vulnerable. Please, because somebody out there needs you whether it's for domestic violence or for anything, they need you and they need us to say, I am here and I am listening. And for those that are struggling um, to reach out for help, it just takes a small step. That's it. I don't have to know you. I don't have to be recommended. You don't have to find someone who knows me. You can look us all up. And if I'm close, I'm coming. And if I'm not close, and Trina's coming. And if Trina's not close, Kathy's coming. And if we're not close, we know someone who is close. We will link you with whomever it takes to get you the help because we know what it is to escape. We know what it is to survive. 
and we will help you. We will help you. Chief Master Sergeant Kathy Nisley and Sharia Cordona and Christina Warner. Thank you so much for sharing and for being the change that you want to see in the Air Force. Hey! The hat looks hey, good. Hey, 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 no. hey. It is Terry, <laughs> and I have Chief Nisley with me here. As you guys may have realized, this has been a pre recorded video, but I am so glad that you shared. Thank you for all the comments, the love everything we're gonna have the other chiefs here come on in a second and they're gonna be themselves live and in living color it is friday afternoon here on the camouflage beauty platform at 5 p.m on friday we have a glass of wine so if you are drinking whether it is wine water tea coffee you name it we are here for it i am going to bring in chief cardona next and add her to the platform Trina. as well chief cardona are you there I can't see you just yet, but maybe, uh, let's see, let's see. Give me one second. And I want you guys to be, hey, she's here with hey, her family. Frida. Thank you guys so much. Hi, everybody. I am, I'm so glad that they're here because we have an exciting announcement for those of you who did watch. Thank you guys for staying with us. I know it was very long, uh, but it's such a powerful story, well needed. Um, tag a girlfriend, a guy friend, a mentor, a mentee, whoever there is. And I have Chief Warner here. She is now here and we're gonna add her to the stream as well. Chief Warner, are you here? Can you see me? I think I can see you. All right, you guys are good. Let me take you guys off mute. I'm so excited. You can take your your, your uh, mics off mute. Um, I'm so excited that you guys are here. Your story was absolutely powerful. The feedback that we received from everyone watching and listening was just so powerful in itself. Uh, I'm so thank you for being you guys are here. Your story was absolutely thank powerful. Thank you for being on the Camouflage Beauty platform. It's, it's just been an amazing experience so to get to know you personally you guys, and to uh, speak with you and hear your stories and of your of you, your survival, and your families, your children, your husbands, um, your friends, and everyone who has supported you along the way. But I know you guys have a big announcement for April 29th, and I want everyone that's still tuned into the platform to hear this directly from you because it is absolutely so important. I'm excited. I can't wait. I've been sharing this already on Instagram and, and, and uh, Facebook. So if you guys don't follow me that you're watching right now, please, please, please go to Camouflage Beauty, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook, share with somebody and I will allow the Chiefs to talk about their big announcement so you can hear so much more. I will caution you though, you're gonna need some tissues. Because if you thought this was powerful, just wait till you hear what's coming next. Who wants to go? Who wants to talk about this big venture? Chris. <laughs> Chief Warner, you're on mute. It's on you. I was yes. saying that's what we do. We just we just call each other out like that, but that's what sisters do, yes. you know. So if y'all don't know, on April 29th. We are releasing our book, but we are co-authors in My Walk Past Hell, sharing our stories. And let me tell you, the 31 ladies in this book, we are bringing the heat, hence the title, My Walk Past Hell. We drop fire on you, you know, to let you know that you can overcome and you can succeed. And um, most importantly, none of us look like what we've been through. Uh, it's amazing for me to be on this panel um, with Kathy and with Trina because they are the most beautiful women. And I don't say that because of their physical features, but because of their stories and who they are and the way that even though they've been through all these things, they share their light and their love with the world. I'm so blessed to know them as well as the co-authors um, on the book. And so I'm appreciative of this opportunity. I'm going to tell you all right now, tune in. We're going live for a book release. We're going to be posting. We're so excited to share our stories. So that's my spiel. 
hashtag by the book. Yes. That's right, Chris. That's right. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to each of our stories. Um, it was extremely emotional, uh, but it's something that needed to be told. And, uh, you know, through telling that story, I have uh, gained a lot of strength and courage. And so about this book. OK, yes. As as my sister Chief Chris mentioned, uh, we are soon releasing this book and I'm just honored to be a part of it. And I'm even more honored that uh, our visionary author, Dr. Yolanda Jerry, we are hashtag Dr. Jerry's tribe and yes. there are 31 of us wonderful, powerful, resilient co-authors. We are showing up and they they showed out, y'all. They showed out. Just like Chris said, you know, we about to drop the bomb. Uh, again, I share with you all my, my hashtag for 2021, and that is unveil. And I promised myself that I would truly unveil and unleash to you all the raw uh, events and passion that comes through with that and uh, just totally being vulnerable and in the moment and giving you some good stuff. The title of my chapter is Against All Odds. I'm so excited. I'm so thankful. And I thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, how do I follow that up? So April 29th, you need to buy it. It's going to be really good. There are 31 powerful women coming and bringing their stories, opening up, being transparent. We are a part of the Dr. Yolanda Jared tribe, and we love it. And it, it is life changing. It is transformational. So as soon as the book hits the stands, get out there, get it, and read up on how awesome these 31 women are. Bring it. In the words of Tiffany Haddish, we ready. Yep. Well, I am excited, but before being excited, I am absolutely proud to know you all, to work with you all, to serve with you all in the United States Air Force. These are the type of leaders that we need to be transparent, to be able to have these conversations, to be vulnerable, and to be intrusive, to be here for us as we go through challenges ourselves. So we are absolutely proud of you, ladies, as chiefs, as mothers, as women. Chief Cardono, shout out to your children there. Uh, Chief Nisley, I know your husband was watching, so shout out to him as well. And all you had your families and supporters watching. Chief Warner, I saw your sister online as well. And this is the uncut version of us. This is not the made up. This is not the pre-recorded. This is not the edited. This is who these women are on a regular day. If you do not know them, take the opportunity to get to know them, whether it's, whether it's through the pages of my Walk Past Hell set to release on 29 April, where you'll hear their stories, as well as other women who have survived uh, the unthinkable. Whether it's there or if you want to log, find them on Facebook or Instagram or even on your government email. If you are suffering from domestic violence or any form of intimate partner abuse, reach out to anyone that you see on your Facebook page right now. Reach out to any one of these chiefs or myself. This is not for camouflage beauty. This is not for the chiefs. This is not for any of this. If you are suffering, do not suffer alone. We are here to help you. And I promise you, not only are we here to help you, your story is safe with us. And that is something that I can guarantee. I'm so proud of you all, ladies. I'm so proud to be a part of this journey and just sit back in the in the in the in the stands watching you guys with my tea. By the way, I'm here. I'm drinking my tea and I'm ready. I have been so excited to be a part of your story. To everyone out there watching who supported Camouflage Beauty, thank you as always for your support. And as I like to say, don't forget, be kind to your body, soul, and mind. Bye bye. <laughs>